Today we're back in New York for episode 8 of Talking Watches. We'll be speaking with a jazz guitarist and producer who's collaborated with the likes of Whitney Houston, the Gypsy Kings, Tupac Shakur, and Wu-Tang Clan. His name is Fabrizio Sodi, and today we're Talking Watches. I started playing piano when I was five and then I switched to the guitar when I was nine. Came to United States when I was 16 to try to be the best musician I could be, the best jazz guitarist I could be. A few years later, besides my jazz career, I started to get interested also in producing and writing. Who have you worked with on the producing side? A great variety of people from jazz people like, you know, Cassandra Wilson to hip-hop guys like Wu-Tang Clan, Ghostface, uh, Dead Prez, Q-Tip, Tupac. He wasn't when he was alive, <laughs> but I had the chance to, they gave me the vocals of a song, and I, I could like, you know, make the beat for that song that was actually unreleased. Oh, that's cool. Then also Jennifer Lopez, Whitney Houston. Anything that is good for me, it's good music. For me, there are only two types of music, good and bad music, that's it. And do you take the same view with watches? There are only good and bad watches? For me, it's an attraction type of thing. I have to be attracted to a watch, to, to want it, to own it. And sometimes it's not the best watch. It's not the, the watch that makes the best investment. You know, at this point of my life where like, I understand a little bit about movements, I got really deep into how they make watches, and I see that there isn't the quality of some other pieces that I own, but I love it, so I don't really care. When did you get into watches? I started collecting watches when I was about 17 or 18 years old. Like everyone, you know, my first watch, good watch, was a Rolex, a Datejust. I followed the road of so many people in watches. You go from Rolex, uh, then to, you know, Audemars Spiguet, then to start with the first Patek, and then more complicated watches. And so on Patek, could you tell us about this watch? This is a annual calendar, 5205, which, as you can see, is brand new because I just got it a couple of weeks ago, so I only wore it a couple of times. What I love about this watch First of all, it's the case design, because I think that this case was just introduced with this watch, because I've never seen this case before on a paddock. It's an annual calendar with moon phase, so I mean, it's definitely a great movement. And also I think the metal, it's amazing, because this type of rose gold, like just the, just the color. Especially this watch, they make it in different dials, but with the black dial, I think it's really outstanding. And you also have another paddock annual, the 5396 Tiffany. I also have the 5396 Tiffany, which is absolutely one of my favorites. So moving up the chain a little bit in the world of Paddock is a watch that honestly at this point is really starting to become the official watch of, of Talking Watches. John Mayer mentioned it, JJ Reddick mentioned it, and now you have one here. This is a 5970. Yeah. This is a 5970J that I bought in Las Vegas. It's probably one of my favorite watches. It has a classic complication, which is, you know, perpetual calendar with chrono. So it's really everything you need. I also love the movement, the fact it's a still Alemannia movement made for Patek. So this is like, what can you say? You know, it's just perfect in every way. Perfect size, perfect shape, perfect movement, just a great watch. You also have even gone further into Patek complications, mm -hmm. as you have a 5074. Yeah, I have a 5074 in platinum yeah. with black diet. Unfortunately, it's being serviced at the moment, but uh, yeah, that's my pride and joy. This is something <laughs> I kind of dream of, the day that you get your Patek Philippe minute repeater, what's the feeling like? I mean, for me, I'm a musician, so the first thing I want to check out is the sound. There are uh, a lot of theories about which metal sounds best. I've heard a few Pateks, but I haven't heard all of them, or like the same watch in different metals, you know, how it would sound. I think this is a very fascinating complication, and it's also an art for me. When you get to that level of watchmaking, there are only a few watchmakers in the world that can really do that in the right way, or only just even do that. I compare it to owning uh, a Kandinsky or a Chagall or any great painter. The watch for me at that level is exactly the same thing. And do you wear it often? Yeah, I wear it, you know, from time to time. I feel very fortunate to own this kind of stuff and I see that's something that I own for the moment. So it's something that I want to take care of and then pass on to, you know, either my family or whoever else will acquire that one day, you know. So on the topic of complicated watches, you're wearing a tourbillon right now. Yeah, so today I'm wearing is Audemars Piguet tourbillon chronograph with the movement designed by the great Mr. Papi. What Papi did with the escapement, he found a way that even when you use the chronograph, you don't really lose any pulse, so the movement keeps precise time, you know, when you're using the chronograph. When I was talking about work of art, I mean, when you look at this watch, what can you say? 
I mean, it speaks for itself. What is special about this Rolex? This Rolex Daytona is an A-series. It's the last one they made with the Zenith movement. After that, you know, Rolex started to make uh, you know, their own movement for this. And also, it has the so-called Patrizzi dial. Mm -hmm. If you don't go into the older ones, you know, the Paul Newmans and stuff, I think in the modern Daytona, I think it's the Daytona to have. It's one of these watches that you can wear if you're doing sports, if you have a nice suit, a meeting, anything. You know, it's just one of these Eastern classics. Definitely. You know? I think that's a lot of the, the charm of Rolex. And this one in particular, it's one of the few more recent to actually show some age. I mean, this, yeah. is, this is a, a patina dial. This yeah. is not, you know, yeah. naturally like that. Yeah, so it's unique because you can never get two that are exactly the same. So could you tell us about the Panerai? This is like a, a modern Panerai, it's not a vintage one. But it has this vintage look, this strong vintage look. Also, you can read the time at night very well because of the Luminov is very strong. And also, I think it's a you know, great effect that, you know, it has its own movement, its own manufacturing movements. So I think in the modern Panerai, this is one of my favorites. And then finally, I think something that's so interesting, especially for a man that owns a paddock mini repeater and wearing a chrono turbine on his wrist, also has a Tudor. When I was a kid, I remember seeing Tudors around. I think that this watch is outstanding. I mean, they reproduced, I think they used to make this in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And it's been associated with a lot of car racing and stuff. I just love what they did with this watch because everything is perfect with this watch. You know, from the color to the choice of materials. This shows you that, you know, my collection can go from a very, in theory, basic and simple watch to uh, some super esoteric stuff. But I enjoy them exactly in the same way. What's an example of a watch that you bought and you regret it later? There isn't like one particular watch that I really regret. But there are some watches that I own for like, you know, just a month. To give you an example, a lot of uh, the, the modern Rolexes, you know, to me, like they, they became way too big, way too bulky. You know, as you get more and more into watches, you tend to shrink your collection to what is really important on each brand that you own. To me, it doesn't make sense to own like 20 stainless steel Rolexes, you know. At this point of my life, I'm shrinking to pieces that represent something meaningful for that brand, for that particular complication, year or case or whatever the case may be, but I'm shrinking to the core of what is important, at least for me, in my collection. And is there one watch that you're still dying to get the goal? Of course, I would love uh, one day to get like a, a custom paddock, get a special dial done or something that I'm the only one to own. That's the ultimate goal.